So my name is Jamie Simpson. I operate a place called the Culinary Vegetable Institute on a farm called the Chef's Garden. And on that farm, we grow vegetables and herbs and flowers and things. You'll see some of that throughout the day. Um, as I guess this anti-convention, we're going to just keep in theme with that. I'll be your anti-moderator for the morning. Uh, I've never moderated a conversation like this before, and these will be your anti-panelists. We'll start with... Anti-moderation. <laughs> yeah. We'll start with uh, Chef yep. Jason yep. Howard, which I think is, um, you know, mm. I think is a, is, a, is a perfect person for this particular mm. conversation. The man born in Barbados, right? Yeah, right. Lives in the bright, sunny shores of London. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Very good. Known internationally for his modern approach to Caribbean ingredients. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Correct. 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 His food is iconic. He's sexy as hell. Please welcome <laughs> Jack Jason Howard. Uh, thank you. Our next guest, our anti-panelist, uh, <laughs> Chef Brad Kilgore, a good old friend. He describes himself as a, a Midwestern boy from Kansas. It's just a fact. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Another fact, the man uh, worked at the American restaurant Alinea, L2O, Laurent Gras, Azul, John George, Opened Altar, <coughs> Opened Kaido, opened Ember, right? Now runs Marigold. Congratulations. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. Was named Restaurant of the Year, Best New Restaurant, James Beard, Best New Chef, and uh, was listed on World's 50 Best at some point, somewhere along the line. Congratulations to all that. Kind of sexy, not my type. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take second to Chef. <laughs> Yeah. Well, all right, so this, this, this culinary genius on a plate concept, you know, I was just thinking about it a little bit last night. I think the topic is more than, like, pretty food, right? It's, and genius is more than aesthetic, right? So on the front end of this conversation, I want to dig into that a little bit. Um, not about just putting pretty food on a plate, right? Picture this. You're walking through a, a gallery uh, in a museum, and everyone knows... Goya or let's say like Van Gogh or something like that, right? And you see this painting you've never seen before, but you know exactly who painted it. Are you with me? You're driving in your car and you hear a song you've never heard before, and you know exactly who sang it. You know the one, maybe it's a... Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift is a great example. <laughs> Dave Brubeck, I was going to go, but you know, sure. it's a Brubeck, it's a, it's a thing. When I see a Jason Howard, I know it's a Jason Howard, mm -hmm. right? If I see a Brad Kilgore, I, I, I know it's a Brad Kilgore. And I want to know from both of you, what makes you, you, right? In that example. Anybody starts. <laughs> um, when it comes to plating for me, it's quite simple. I let the produce speak for itself. I try not to basically interfere with it too much and try to keep it as, I would say, as um, pure as possible. And try to utilize the color of the vegetables as well. Usually if you see one of my plates, you would see these bright colors. You would see things very vivid. Um, that's not editing. <laughs> that's basically the ingredients that we try to um, make sure it comes out or it is portrayed on the plate. Um, I do modern Caribbean cuisine and Basically, in a nutshell, modern Caribbean cuisine is like carnival on a plate. It needs to be bright, it needs to be inviting, it needs to be um, full of rum. It needs, it's not really rum, but it needs to be fun. You understand what I'm saying, and it needs to be inviting. Um, and also, it, it, it's, it's very something that should hit you the first time you see it, and then the smell, and then the taste. And you know, it's basically three dimensional art, as I say. It, it comes at you from different points. As, 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 um, as art itself. So for me, that's how I see it, and that's how I approach it. I believe food should be beautiful, 
and I believe that it should be done in stages as well. Your food has a, a very, very distinguishable color palette. I actually, um, this morning, I blended four of your plates and pulled a Pantone off of it. And according to Pantone, your color is 2592C, oh. which is a, a very deep purple. Yeah. Very deep. Purple. Purple. Oh, God, yeah. I can't escape purple, can you I? can't escape it. <laughs> Um, it's gorgeous. No, it's. I mean, it's a. It's a very. It's a very thing. And then, and then also the the nasturtiums, the mustards, and all those other things that you incorporate. I think it's great. Now, Brad, what makes a Brad Kilgore? You know, each dish, basically, there may be something I'm trying to say or a story I'm trying to tell. Um, not. It could just. The story could literally be the seasonal ingredient. It doesn't necessarily have to be an entire book or a long-winded, you know, inspiration. So. Sometimes that also is how you want the guests to eat the dish. Building a dish, and I, I use the word building because that's how I look at it. The puree has a certain viscosity to it. The sauce has a certain nappe to it. The you know, crumble has a certain texture and size to it, all with a thought. Um, when I'm designing a dish, I do look at it like a build, architecturally. Things need to be able to make it all the way to the dining room. At the same time, it needs to be done quickly and efficiently and exactly the same over and over and over. So I look at things architecturally and I think about them, how can we get this done consistently, and which also helps design the mise en place all the way back into the prep because you know exactly how many you're going to get out of it, what exactly is the process, and then for myself, I can pick out, point out maybe a mistake in the kitchen from 20 feet, feet away because things are so consistent. I can tell just by a color or a texture or how a sauce is laying on the plate or coming out of a bottle if something along the way wasn't followed correctly or if there is a mistake being made. So it's about the build. Yeah. Here's what I think in addition, in addition to that. I've been to Kansas, right? I, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, d I don't think you're making any, like, you know, grand culinary statements on heritage like Chef Jason. Mm. You know, I think, I think you generally lean towards ingredients within reach and within your current region, wherever that place is. All right? Definitely. Um, would you say... Technically, you're rooted in, in I, 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 I'd almost say you cook like a pastry chef. Is that fair? 1,000%. Okay. That's why I was a pastry chef for like four years. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Actually, that's really, really interesting that you bring that up. I decided after, you know, getting up to a tournaut position before sous chef, um, basically at that time I thought I knew everything, um, and I decided to start working in pastry because in pastry, if you can imagine it, you can build it. Now, you know, you have sugar sculptures and all those things, they don't necessarily taste good, um, but you can build it. And so I wanted to know how to do that. And then I've transformed a lot of those techniques into savory, just pulling out sugar, replacing flour, you know, different things like that. So, um, and it's very technical, it's very consistent and streamlined in that department. So, great point. Now, in contrast to that, um, Jason, I feel like you. You are making a cultural statement of origin, generally, right? No matter where in the world you are, do you feel like you're leaning into uh, the sweet potatoes and the and the octopus and the seafoods and things like that? No matter where. Yeah, correct. Um, but to be honest, first and foremost, I focus on flavor and keeping things historically correct, but just changing the imagery of them and using modern equipment and tools to reshape how the dishes look. And I guess at some point I came across that I could actually play it. <laughs> That's it. Right. Are you an artist in other mediums? No, I, I used to. I used to draw a lot when I was younger and I did interior decorating and stuff before. So I tend to draw to these artistic side of things, you know. Um, I tend to love art and, and, and 
classical music and stuff that a lot of people think I might not like, but I tend to like the finer things like, like that. But for me, plating and I would say translating food on a plate to something that is very appetizing and stuff is, is something that I love to do. And something you can't see in Instagram, right? You referenced mm. yesterday seasoning with things like scotch bonnets. And yeah. Nasturtiums. Yeah, I tend to use um, Scotch bonnet because in modern Caribbean cuisine, it's it's a new cuisine and it's young. It's in its infancy, and you need to be need to be true to the cuisine. And one thing of being true to the cuisine is using the ingredients we have. I know a lot of you might hear Scotch bonnet or habanero and feel like you know that's it's very very um what you would say violent. It's a violent um, herb or spice. It's not. It is so subtle. It has so much flavor. It has so much technicality. And I cook everything with it. And if you had to taste one of my dishes, you would be like, wow, it's so inviting, it's so warm, and it's so friendly. And that is the different approach I have to it. So every, every video you might see or every um, description I might put up, you might see Scotch bonnet. Don't, 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 don't just think heat, think yeah. flavor, sure. because Scotch bonnet and habanero chilies and stuff carry a lot of flavor, and they offer a lot to a dish. And, one of the things where I've been discussing and basically researching is their flavors. There's salty, sweet, bitter, umami, etc. There's also chili. Believe when I tell you, there's also chili. And when you add chili to something or you add scotch bonnet to something, it's like adding salt to something that has not had any salt. It brings a different complexity toward, to it as well. And the longer you leave those chilies to sit and stuff, they actually mature into something different and that is something that I, I love to, to um, utilize in my cooking and stuff and different ingredients, fish, curing, smoking, a lot of these things have been lost to Caribbean cuisine and it's to bring them back and show the international um, community that you know Caribbean cuisine is something for everyone to actually get involved with. Let's get involved with it. <laughs> yeah. Let's see it. Rock and roll. Um, so we'll start with really while we're here. Um, you're going to walk us through uh, building a Jason Howard. Yeah. So basically what I have done is I have some leaks. And again, as I said, it's trying to keep the ingredients as simple as possible. The leeks are basically sous vide in scotch bonnet. Again. And the scotch bonnet oil brings out a different like complexity to, to the leak. So basically we have the leak that is sous vide at 80 degrees for two hours. Then we take it out from there, we cut it in half, and then we just torch it a bit and into the oven. Also we have some carrots that I've prepared as well. I try to keep things quite straightforward when I'm plating. So basically a carrot is long. So if I'm presenting it, I'm going to present it length is long, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think you guys know what I'm meaning. Also with that, I have some plantain puree, and this is plantain and um, turmeric. So when I use the plantains is when they're black, they're really black and you know, all the flies are getting ready to the, just jump on them. But this plantain puree starts to ferment and the natural sugars in the plantain comes out and it's, as one chef told me, it's like eating banana bread. <laughs> Yeah, but the flavor is so different and it's so complex. And it goes really well with the lamb, but plantain is another versatile vegetable that it has different stages to it. When it's green, it's full of starch. When it's, as my mom says, when it's dead, it's full of sugar. <laughs> but you, you can do so much different things with it at so much different stages. It's incredible. And I call it the potato of the Caribbean. So for me, I love to use things like plantain and stuff. And for this dish, I have it in a puree, which in it is a texture for this dish as well. So you have the texture of the carrots, the texture of the leeks, the texture of the plantain puree. Um, if the overhead camera, if I can show you all. So one thing I do while I'm approaching my dishes is I look at shapes a lot. I always look at patterns. So if I see a dish, the first thing I look at is a pattern. And I, and I think you guys will recognize patterns as well, is when you see a plate, you will say, this is an individual's plate. What you're doing basically is you're starting to recognize the pattern the individual is going down. And for one of my patterns is shapes. So basically, as you will see the leak, the leak is rectangular. And again, the carrot's rectangular. So I'm going in accordance to the shapes. 
we got the Purina squeezy bottle. I would always say a squeezy bottle is a chef's best friend. And this would give me a circle. Also, I've prepared the lamb, which is the rack off of the bone. I know some of you will be like, why take the rack off the bone? Trust me, there's a lot of benefits of taking the rack off the bone. If you want the bone, we can put the bone inside the plate for you as well, <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying. So basically, we've prepared the lamb, and if you look at the lamb again, the lamb is rectangular. So if you look at plating, you want to approach plating, think about clean, center of the plate, and shapes. Also, with this plating, is, I've chosen this plating basically because this is about four steps. Step one, step two, step three, four and sauce. It is always good to approach a plating in steps, especially if you're having a banqueting, if you're pushing out numbers. You know, you don't want to have anything overcomplicated, and sometimes we as chefs forget that we might be a level five in skill, but we also have a team that is below us that has different skill sets, and we need to bring them along to a level five as well. So it's good to start with different things like this and components on a plate. And you would you'd be surprised when you start to see your team do these simple steps. They start to feel so much more confident and they start to, you know, they start to um, be able to get a little bit more complicated as well. So we're using the squeezy bottle to start because we can actually pull with a spatula. We could actually be doing all sorts of different stuff that is a bit more complicated. So the first thing we're going to start with is basically the leeks. We're going to put down the leek. And leek just off center because we want that dish to be built in the middle of the plate. So we just have the leek just off center. We're going to come with the carrots now. Just one, two. And don't mind my hands shaking. Trust me, I'm nervous as hell. So. Oh, you're always shaking. <laughs> Trust you're me. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I've, I'm very nervous. I've never been to San Diego before, so. You know. No, I like. I mean, I like. I, I like the concept overall to think about, like, you know, building plates and stages because. Yeah. So let me just look at the stages and and also always try to pre-plate a dish before the time. There's nothing wrong with building a dish and seeing what it looks like. It's like an architect actually going on a computer to see how things are going to look. Always get your raw components. You don't need to cook them. And just put them on a plate and see how they're going to look before time. Nothing is wrong with that. You know, I have a million dishes you have not seen. Some true nightmares. <laughs> That's right. They're not, all, they're not all winners, right? They're not all winners, trust me. So next step is going to be your puree. Do you draw them ever in advance, like sketch them, anything like that? You keep a notebook? I, I see a lot of people doing it, and I'm always so um, like amazed, like, wow, really, you can do that? I cannot conceptualize it like that. I'm sorry. It's going to go so left so quickly. <laughs> it's going to be like, what were you trying to do? But it's going to be always beautiful because, for me, it's never knowing what it's going to look like is quite exciting for me. I saw you yesterday when we were talking about this dish, and you said maybe like the, on, you're holding an empty plate, and you said the leek's going to go here, and the carrots are going to go here and here, and the lamb's going to go here, and the sauce is going to go here. And you, you know, with your hand gestures, you could, you almost like sort of materialized it. Is that kind of how you think about these things? Yeah. Once I'm dealing with shapes, once I'm dealing with shapes, I know how shapes can go down. So again, as I'm saying, think about it as shapes on a plate. Sometimes you might have a piece of fish or you might have a piece of lamb, or you might have a piece of duck, whichever meat. Each meat has a shape. It's not perfectly shaped, but you can think about it. Sometimes you can slice a piece of duck, sometimes you can slice a piece of chicken, you can put chicken in a ballantine. You can control shapes of food, especially pork belly. That way I love to work with pork belly. You can press pork belly, it can be very flat. It's something that can be worked with very, very easily. So for this plate, you can see simple steps is one, two, three, four and there's one dot. We can complicate it again by going two, four, five, six, seven, as much dots as possible, look like polka dot, whatever we want to do. We can keep going with this, but it's best to keep this simplistic. You want to keep it more pure for your team so that they know how the, how the ingredients go down. And two, one of the hardest things that I always find with plating and teaching people plating is 
so many people cannot locate the center of a plate. <laughs> yes, that is true. I will show you it, and we will point at it, and we will put it on your table, and I will come back, and you'll be so left, or you'll be so right, you'll be like, how did you get there? This is the center of the plate. I want you to be a little bit left, a little bit right, and you're like, how did you do this? So for me, that is the hardest part, just locating the center of the plate for, for, for um, your team and stuff like that. But again, as you can see this, we can just source at this point and send. True? True. Correct. But you know me, we're not. So one of the things we're going to do is, I'm just going to offset the plate a bit with a bit of puree right here. Right, to your point of this. Again, as you can see, it's starting to develop into something a bit different. And that is it. So we add a little bit more complexity to the dish. And this is one of my favorite parts, dressing the plate. Some people ask me, why do you have to put flowers on the plate? It's not just flowers. Each ingredient adds something. This is orange coriander. This actually helps lift the dish as well and is quite beautiful. But it's like the plate is an attractive lady. She has her dress on. She's ready to go out. It's time to give her handbags. It's time to give her some earrings. You know, <laughs> come on. <laughs> so this is, this is, This is her aesthetic that we're, we're adding at this point in time. One of the things I tend to try to keep away from, and you can see, you see, I'm just gonna stick to my button, is tweezers. I don't really like using tweezers because then it just look like an invalid just <laughs> jittering all over the place, but sometimes just for the technicality of things, just with flowers or anything, you, you, you might have to use them once in a while. Nothing's wrong with using tweezers. Some chefs use them more masterful than I do. And just a bit of coriander, cress. Brought to you by the chef's garden. Correct, beautifully. And we finish with sauce. Usually, to help your team and stuff, there's some squeezy bottles you can start them off with. And there's the basic squeezy bottles. We keep them in a water circulator just to keep them at room temperature or at the temperature that you prefer. And this is more precision. Again, this is a dish that if we kept it at stage four, we would just finish with sauce and you have a beautiful plate of food to send out. So we're just gonna sauce now. and finish with some green coriander oil as well. Green is a color that actually attracts your, your, your um, eye and your retina. It's, 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 some, it's something like, um, I would say like, um, it's coffee for the eyes. Let's say that. So just a bit of that, and that helps contrast the dish beautifully. Simple for me, technically. But if, if um, what I've said, has actually hit home to you in how to just put the dish together with those simple, easy steps, then I think right. I've done my job. But this would be a lamb dish that we would serve um, with modern Caribbean flavors and, and, and um, influences. And I think that is what modern Caribbean cuisine looks like on a plate. And this lamb would have been black belly sheep, uh -huh. which is something yeah, indigenous ask, no, to what, Barbados. What's the goat or something? Yeah, it's really gamey. Okay. Black belly sheep is really gamey. And let's say black belly sheep tastes more gamey than venison. But when you remove the bone and stuff, it helps with the flavor of that. But I find when we do it with the normal rat is a little bit more subtle as well, but it would be this that we would basically serve. That's beautiful. Um, as, a, uh, as, a, as a human that lives on a farm and treats our kitchen like a, like a farmhouse, we struggle with things like waste. When I'm cutting perfect round carrot tubes, yeah. what are you doing with the rest of that thing, Chef? Yeah, so basically I know one of the things for you guys would be wastage. 
we waste nothing. We plan our menus out from the beginning to the end. The leeks, those go with your sauce, making your stock. And we could also say, you, you just throw the carrots in there as well. No, we would plan out the soup. So for this, for banquet, we will have a starter of a soup, which would be the carrot and carrot and sea moss. So sea moss is basically, I think, um, everyone's on it now. But for me as a boy growing up, I hated it. Now I can't get enough of it. So basically what we're gonna do is a carrot and sea moss soup with sweet potato and sesame mash. So we start, let's find the center of our plate. <laughs> and we're just gonna put on a little bit of mash so for me, when I'm plating, this is my job. I just go through and put the mash in the center of the plate so the guys can find it. And then, you know, at some point, someone has it at this end still. So we're going to come down again <laughs> with the carrot. Again, we have a nice roasted piece of carrot, but this one is roasted in with citrus as well. We have an orange in Barbados we call flux. I think you might know flux, John. <laughs> flux is a very ugly looking orange. But for this, it's, it, it has so much complexity in the skin, in the rind, and in the pef as well. So we put the mash inside of, I think we call this a, a ribbon. Yeah. Yeah, that I think is like a Jason Howard staple, is the flat tip. Yeah, this is the ribbon mold. So we start. Nailed it. Yeah. yeah. Thank God. So for this one as well, that is one, two, and three. So again, we focus on keeping things in the middle of the plate. So for starters, as you get more complex, you can move things to the side of the plate. You can play it on the rim of the plate. You can do a lot of stuff like that, but we're gonna start quite slow and steady. Again, some, oh, this one has not come up properly, sorry. Just trying to find the right <laughs> aesthetics. The dish, okay. So let me go and do that. Okay. And let's just call that day here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have, we go there. So with this again, we just, a little bit of herb oil. And we will start with a bit of the soup. So usually when I plate soups, we put a little bit in the bowl to help with the plating of the rest of the items. Yes. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. And then you would finish at the table with the rest of the soup. So for me, that would be a quite simple plating to do and something that could actually go in a banquet um, setting as well and quite straightforward. So we technically waste nothing. If we're going to basically be doing something a bit more technical with the carrots and stuff, we would try to utilize the soup um, within the soup as well. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, I would uh, advise or, or suggest all of you follow Chef Jason Howard. Learn um, how he makes his uh, little glass leaves. What do you call those? Yeah, um, glass leaf as well, which in, is one thing we were trying to do was utilize the whole of the plant in a Start dish. So basically we, we were getting fresh um, pears with leaves on them. And we were like, what if we could actually use the leaf? And we were using the leaf just to stick into the, you know, sometimes you would make like the dessert in the morning, just stick the leaf into it. We were like, how could we carry it a little bit further? So after some research, I found this old technique where you soak the leaves for 12 days and every day you change the water 
And what happens is when you brush it, it removes the flesh and leaves the skeleton of the leaf. It's gorgeous. Yeah. So then we just so we just um, dip those in a pear syrup as well, and it just comes out like a glass leaf with the skeleton That's in the it. middle. It was really cool. So it's things like that, that I like to look up as well and yeah. try to incorporate into my pleadings. Yeah. Track them down. Uh, thank you, Chef. Thank you. For that. Um, stick around. Don't go anywhere. Because we're going to have some questions for you. And is this uh, seasoned with uh, scotch bonnet? Everything is seasoned with scotch bonnet. Yeah. Very good. Next, we're going to walk through, um, you know, Brad Kilgore's concepts a little bit, understand, you know, a little bit about the way he thinks about, about ingredients, and I'm excited and grateful for that opportunity as well. Same here. Thank you, Chef. Uh, thank you. All right, give me one second. Just going to so finish I ask, setting up. I guess, while you get set up, you know, I've, I've worked with uh, Brad for several years. We've done a bunch of events together. You know, and I, I had a... I, I got his vibe at one point. I think I kind of get the vibe. It always changes, and it's always sort of like tripping me up. But if I were to try and approach a Brad Kilgore, I might take a piece of celery root, blend it into some form of a twill, dry it in a dehydrator, make some kind of organic uh, shapes with that, and place it on something that's fucking delicious, but not like, you know, doesn't have to be like gorgeous front and center because you're going to we're going to bury it in this, in this twill. And then we might plug in some other textures, other sauces, other, other oils. Am I going in the right direction? Yeah, you might as well finish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, Nailed it's, it. Uh, Nailed it. It's good. I like I like what you're doing also with banana. Being in Miami right now, you're. Um, I, I saw some banana miso blended together. I love those two combinations. I imagine Absolutely. That's fucking great. I dipped into plantain on my most recent menu. I mean, like you mentioned from you Kansas. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna put all the beautiful Chef Garden stuff on this side. Um, not normal for me to cook with plantains. Doesn't come from where I come from. But I think that's how I help find my voice in general is because I didn't really have culinary inspiration from my heritage. So, yeah, you know, what of course, uh, my <laughs> my house we didn't really cook. What is the, a lot uh, of things came out of packages. What does the 1980s Kansas look like? Stouffer's. Yeah. Frozen chicken breasts. Okay. Um, toaster strudels. Uh, pop tarts, a lot of things that look like pop tarts. Yep. Um, and then I started seeing the world a little bit and decided I wanted to go in a different direction than that. My parents, you know, I thought a chef was was Outback Steakhouse. That's where we went for my dad's birthday. You know, that was our nice meal out. So um, I assume how I mentally got to where I'm at is because I get to get inspired by other people's food cultures. Um, so it allows me to not really have any boundaries because I'm getting all of it. You know, I, it's yeah. not like I grew up in an Italian uh, grandma cooking every night, you know? Right. right. But I mean, you're not just doing like Miami food. You're also like a partner in a pizza concept and yes. you know, a couple other things. No, I, I feel, you know, cooking is cooking. It's a, a reaction of either heat or some sort of manipulation. Um, and every culture has its own way of doing it, and it, it's a never-ending amount of knowledge and wealth. So just keep going. Understood. What are we thinking? OK. So uh, this dish is specifically designed to kind of convey my style, or at least when I really kind of go after it, how I like to think and build a dish like I was mentioning before. Um, so this one is, I'm calling it Spring's Shadow. Um, Wait, Jason, how many steps is this one? I didn't count either. I think this is our rocket scientist. You should have seen my, <laughs> you should have seen my, uh, my Wait, order we're gonna do for this chef's for the, wear out. You know, uh, for, the, for the banquet, right? Like this yeah, this is not a of banquet course, dish. Um, 400 person plate up. You know, if you really ask me, it's three steps. It's just a couple more components. Yeah. Um, That's so spring shadow. And then since Jamie lives and works on a farm, he corrected me that it's 
it's not it's spring, not like it's nor spring, was right? any of these items grown in spring. Um, <laughs> but they do grow in spring, yes, all right? So it's conceptually where we're at. Um, so I have a beautiful felt and fat plate here. Um, it's a canvas, if you will, a white platter. And on top of it, I have three stencils, spring inspired stencils, all right? Uh, this is just clicking around on Etsy. I mean, you know, you can make them. I've seen um, Jamie project images onto um, plastic of fish tubs. Fish tubs, yeah, lids on the fish tubs, mm -hmm. and then carve out things in order to make a stencil or a twill. Yeah. Um, I don't Actually, have time Actually, we did it for the um, Versace Mansion. Event. We did it we for Chef's Roll in Miami. We did a little Versace That's right. uh, logo on a. On That's a right. So. What I'm going to do is take a series of, of powders. Um, one is just a fine herb powder with a little bit of salt. One is a butterfly pea flour. Uh, this is uh, coriander and carrots. And then we have freeze dried tomato. Um, basically, yes, flavor is important. Um, so I conceptualize how the flavors work into the dish as well as, you know, the color themselves. I'm going to dust over these silhouettes um, and then remove the silhouettes and then begin building the dish itself. So we'll start with the fine herb. Now one thing to think about when you're doing powders, if you fill this thing up, your radius of powder is going to be two and a half or three inches. So oh. if you're trying to specifically powder onto a plate but you fill up your, your sifter, you're going to get it all over the place. So basically whatever the width it is at the bottom of your strainer or sifter or whatever you're using is that's the width that you're going to get onto the plate. That's a great, Just great something great to think about. Comment. Okay, green. We're going to start off with there he is. Uh, of course, I want to be green. I'm kind of starting darker into lighter at the top. See, I'm not tapping the actual strainer itself. I'm tapping the top of it. Uh, excuse me, the handle near my thumb. It helps me control the flow a little bit better. Every powder is going to have its different texture too, so you're going to have to like learn which ones are coming out quickly. Um, the freeze dried tomato powder is a little granule, so it'll come out differently as well. So I'm basically just coloring. Um, my mother's side of the family are all artists, draw, paint. Um, my stick figures are embarrassingly bad. I cannot draw. It's equally as bad as my handwriting. So I think maybe sort of this is where I ended up as a medium, if you will. So when you sketch these out, uh, you're going like mental here. Or you just picture it in your head, and then you're just in my head. Sort of figure that out. Yeah, it's just in my head. Uh, the sketch will probably take away the inspiration. To be honest, it'll be that bad. Um, all right, so we've got the green down. So those are all the different leafy and stems and things that I would imagine to be green. Uh, we're going to go with our butterfly pea flower. So butterfly fly pea flower, excuse me, is um, a beautiful ingredient, and it, it, you can use it to infuse in liquids, um, and it comes out super bright. Something to play around with. Um, we used to make a cocktail with it. Of course, you can do it in desserts and things. You can do savory like Chef Jason. Jason, you've got some. Uh You've got some experience with this ingredient, right? Yes. That's so his, that's his Pantone. Bit, yeah, bit. I can see that. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so it doesn't really bring a lot of flavor, um, you know, but it, it's a vibrant, gorgeous color. So my purple's going in. All right. Yeah, we grow them. They're um, in, our, in our little culinary garden. They're gorgeous. They're very. Really, I actually have never seen them. Uh, the whole plant is edible, fresh. and um, you know they trellis up whatever you you give them to to go. Let's see, the tomato one, I maybe went a little bit faster than I thought it was going to, so we'll have a nice little distinct pile of tomato powder on there. Okay, building, building, and then the last one is just the orange of the coriander and carrot. Um, I actually ferment carrots, and then why ferment? Because it salts them. It also um, creates umami, and then so when you dry it out, it actually tastes good and it has a little umami effect. This has been uh, a little coriander seed and salt. 
All right, this will be the final powder. Try not to breathe, Jamie. Don't forget about this one. That is going onto the tree itself. Yeah, he did say yesterday, he's like, you know, one thing, I don't like fucking talking and plating at the same time. So <laughs> I might need a little bit of help. But you're doing great. All right, all right. This is so true. Silence in the kitchen. I did an interview the other day, and they said, what kind of music do you listen to in the kitchen? I was like, there's no music in the kitchen. <laughs> I was like, well, what kind of question is that? Yeah. Okay, so here's the... Etsy for the win. Etsy for the win. Look at you. Couple coffees this morning. Helps out. Okay. Oh man. I'm trying to think. Is is Andrew Friedman still in the building? Andrew. Who is the chef, the Midwest chef, um, Arizona-ish, 1980s, that was dropping stencils on plates? Um, I think he's in today. He's in. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm thinking. John, yeah, John Seifold. Sedler. New Mexico. Give me that towel, please. Right. Yeah, that's. Okay, so. Knowing that you know it wasn't going to be perfect, that was kind of by design. We're going to finish up and garnish that as we go. Okay, so we have a terrine. When I think of spring, think of rabbit, young chicken. This is a terrine of poisson, um, young, tender, uh, local chicken. Basically, it's been brined with rosemary and a few other herbs, uh, not too crazy, and gently cooked. And Rest. then we have a very flat side, and then we have a little rigid side by design, and. Then this is a porcini and dashi powder. Again, visual, but it's always important that the flavors are there. So this will kind of be making our dirt, if you will, but our spring terrine. Okay. How often are you right. building something like custom, you know, for a dish specifically? Yeah, it comes around a couple times a year. I, I can't say like I, I don't seek it out. Um, it is difficult. It can be very expensive too if you really want to make something custom. Um, it's not really an ROI. It's more of a passionate thing. However, you know, some I've made terraniums before and then made a. Um, it was. Inside the terrarium was birch wood and moss and things, and it lit up, had a little power switch and lights and glass on top, and then wood on the outside, and it, it was a tree inside, right? So, um, which, if you're using a wooden box with like birch inside of it, that's a fallen tree. And then I made a dish with um, heart of palm, and then we carved out a uh, royal trumpet mushroom with ring cutters, seared that after braising it and I made a fallen tree. So you're eating a fallen tree on a box of fallen trees. Uh, that one took a long time and they were pretty expensive but it was really fun. Okay, so we have a few purees here. When I also think of spring, um, peas and carrots. So we have English pea and parsley. Nine times out of ten if I'm doing a green puree, I will pair it with an herb. Um, parsley makes things very green. And then I have a carrot puree, a little uh, cardamom ginger in there. And uh, this is carrots cooked in carrot juice. So if you cut the carrot, peel it, cut it out the core, remove the core, juice the core and the tips and ends, um, and then cook your carrots in that, you'll get, or at least I find, to get the, the brightest puree. Okay, so we're going to start, see if you can Let get that, that angle. Give me that. Wait, not, yeah. All right, so pea puree. About to eat all my mise en place. All right, so nice clean dots. I'm building, they're going to be of varying sizes. And we'll go back. Carrot. Are we going to see this on the menu at uh, Marigold? 
maybe a spring terrain of sorts. Something like I could it. definitely keep building off of this concept. I really enjoy it. So now we're getting into medium and smaller dots. This is all going to be glue, of course, for this gorgeous Chef Gardens products, vegetables and herbs, flowers. I'll accent with the pickled pepper one at the end. There we are. Just kind of keep going back and forth. A lot of this is going to get covered up, but when it's not covered up, you want to have that nice, even, bulbous shape. At the same time, uh, structurally, the, the nicer and even your dot is, the more it's going to hold up when you stick little herbs into it. If your dot is all over the place, it's going to fall over. All right. Building up a little bit. Don't always have to go biggest to smallest. Nature's not perfect or geometrically. Okay. A couple more green dots in here. And then we'll start garnishing. All right, I feel like we have our glue. We can always go back and glue more. The pickled pepper is going to go at the end. Okay, incredible. If you don't know the Chef Gardens or if you haven't had a chance to order it yet or check it out, um, basically, as far as I'm concerned, it's the greatest farm on the planet. Farmer Lee Jones, a gentleman walking around with uh, overalls and a red bow tie. Uh, he and the Jones family run the world's greatest farm. Basically, is the reason that we have microgreens and micro vegetables in the world are these guys. So it's called the Chef Gardens, the Chef's Garden, excuse me, for a reason because they listen to the chefs and they ask them what they want and what they're looking for. I specifically asked them to cut and trim these exactly like this for this presentation. You can order, this is a marigold flower and I've been using them for years and they're a very um, obtainable ingredient to find, the flowers. And then this guy said, eat the greens. And I was like, what do you mean eat the greens? And I was just like, eat the greens. And they're called citrus lace, right? Yeah, it's kind of this like orange zest, orange soda, unripe orange peel flavor to those leaves. The whole plant's edible again. Uh, it's a gorgeous, uh, it's a gorgeous plant. I think the farm was growing them for years and I just walked through one day and kind of blew my mind. The first time we connected and you came to Jean George with Antonio Bachour and I, um, you brought some of these. Is it Egyptian starflower? Is that yeah, the? for um, Antonio, yeah. Yeah, and um, they were growing in front of the hotel and uh, he just picked it up off the ground. He's like, here, try that. And I was like, what? You know? <laughs> um, uh, you got in a bar fight that night. I did. I did. I won. Okay. Thanks, Jamie. <laughs> All right, so I'm trimming these. Again, they, they cut these accordingly. These are gorgeous mustard flowers. Um, they, of course, have mustard green flavor. They can be a little wasabi-esque, right? Um, then we have tiny carrots. Gorgeous little tiny carrots. Beautiful. That is, how long does a carrot take to grow um, to that That size? carrot, it's like 30 days. It's 30 days. So like a full-size carrot is like 90 plus, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, once they get to that stage, they kind of blow up from there, but the hardest part is getting them to that stage and keeping the top short enough so they require a lot of light. Oh, really? Yeah, they'll get more like leggy in the winter because there's just less light hours. Interesting. So we have multiple different colors here. So that's so. how I know it's not a spring. Uh, it's not a spring. It's not a spring. <laughs> All right, like a crimson purple here. And then the greens are. Flavorful, uh, flavor palette wise, I compare it to parsley. Uh, I think it's, oh no, I think it's a myth that parsley doesn't have flavor. I think parsley has a very strong flavor, actually, in my opinion. Um, I was even thinking that when I was making the puree for this dish the other day, how aromatic and strong parsley is. So um, you get a lot of carrot and carrot greens. Uh, use them as you would parsley. Um, a lot of people are doing, you know, chimichurris with them, uh, herb purees and things. So. They're definitely a beautiful, usable part. So we're going to start building here, and I'm just going to be pulling from these and talking about the different vegetables. I believe I'm about as trimmed up as I need to be. These are, uh, that's a leek. That's three leeks, actually. Really gorgeous. And they are so flavorful. I usually sear them with as little oil as possible, and then that's it, some sea salt. Um, 
You can mince the tops like chives. Use them raw, of course. Okay. So now we're going to build. What's the best angle for everyone to be able to watch while I put these in? Is, um, you can see right here. Sure. Maybe, maybe that way? Yeah. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. No. I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> we did a dinner last week. Let me, uh, um, a little bit of breathing. Rich Rosendale was with us in the building. He's, you know, he had, uh, I don't know, seven or eight chefs lined up. Eight courses, two hours. That was our timeline. 200 people, 160. I got 15 minute windows per chef. These guys are slotting in and slotting out. It was like magic. Um, Rosendale killed it. Um, Angus McIntosh killed it. My guy Dario killed it. Brad's turn. Come on. He's like this, standing in front of the oven. I'm like, <laughs> chef, you got 45 seconds. I was like, like, I need 30, 39 of those 45 <laughs> seconds. It's like, Two minutes, chef. Yeah, I think you said that. You're like two minutes. Like, I said two minutes for about ten minutes, but yeah, but um, <laughs> seven ten was what was written on the wall, and we put the first you know what piece of food on at seven. You nailed it. So uh, nailed the timing, it. actually, you were right. And in the end of the day, it it, it, it came out. You hit that time perfect. Um, chef, tell us about this very special plant here. Yeah. Uh, I, crystal lettuce is what you guys call it. Uh -huh. um, I actually saw this growing in the streets of Peru the first time. Cool. And I saw it outside of, of um, your guys' farm. So Was it um, like Costa Lima? Or, um, it was Lima, Lima. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we call them crystal lettuces. They're all succulents. Um, okay. Bot so botanically, they're all halophytes. They can grow on coastal regions. They can uh, handle really salty soils. They can be... Pre-seasoned. They, they can be salty themselves, right? Yeah. There's like natural salinity to them. I did eat them off of the street. Yeah. Um, I had to know. They're really beautiful. And also, they have like a like a infinite shelf life on that plate. They'll just live there. Like they'll right? they'll just like grow roots. Okay, so I just put some cilantro. How cool is that cilantro? It's not micro cilantro. Um, it's like what stage is that called? Petite, I think. Petite. How perfect is that, right? Of course. And um, one thing I do like about when it's at that stage, it no longer has the coriander seed, this, which is cilantro seed, connected to it. Because to me, although they're one and the same, coriander is a much different flavor than cilantro. Mm. So if you want coriander in your dish, it's a very specific thing. Um, what Chef Jason was saying about tweezers, I agree. I probably was one of the most obsessed tweezer people on the planet at one point. Um, and I find myself a little bit, not veering away, but using them for specific needs and times. Um, spoons work really well. But this clearly is something that we need a tweezer for. Uh, these are uh, viola. Chef, come work with me on the names of this one. Oh, no clue. No clue? Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's like so a many. thousand of them. So many. It's going to be named after some kind of cheesecake or something. Mm, I like cheesecake. Yep, banana cream. Banana cream. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's so many varieties. On the farm, um, one of our, like, you know, head of research, they were doing some work with um, understanding, like, uh, future trends as it relates to colors for like weddings. And they're kind of working through these like color patterns and color palette projections for like 2025 and 2026. And you're, they're always trying to stay above it with like the flowers specifically because, you know, these big events and Vegas. They want everything to match basically, weddings right? And stuff. Yeah, like if you wanted a, you know, your wedding cake to match your dress, like how else are you going to do that? Uh, one thing I want to note on is what I'm doing here. So once you've already built this and you have these like vines and branches and different things that are sturdy and in a good position, you can start floating things into it and just gently laying them down. Can I ask you both a question while you're here still with me? Um, how important is the plate to you? Um, pretty important. The yeah. actual plate itself. Yeah. How do you feel? I, th I think it's quite I, important. Um, I think um, a vessel is... Is, is something you can't do without, you know? And I see a lot of chefs getting very creative with them. 
some chefs even play on human beings. <laughs> Basically, you're saying, what is a plate? What, what is a plate? Te Correct. Technically, so yeah. Basically, I think a vessel is very important, and it tells a story as well. Yeah, I can of of yeah. what see that you're trying to do and achieve. Sometimes I start with the plate before I get to the the plate can inspire the dish or the the service vessel, like he was saying. Because when you get to this level of plating as well, it's an experience. It's not something you just want to sit down and within 10 minutes you, you, you want something to eat. It's an experience and it's, it's, it's you know, basically the chef's passion on a plate. He's trying to give you something to take you to a certain place. So, Sure. I look forward to seeing the human body by felt and fat or zeolite <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> All right. So... Basically, the idea is that what's on the plate is the shadow. And I even thought about on my way here to get like a desk lamp, like the Toy Story classic desk lamp, and shine it so it had another shadow on the plate. Um, but we knew we would have some big lights and it might be a little difficult. That's why Jamie handed me this. So yeah, that way yeah, we have a yeah, third. A yeah. So, Springs Shadow. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. Do we have time for a round of questions? I don't know how much time do we have. Zero? Did you say zero, Chris? Mm, that's good. Does anybody have a question? Sir. Let me answer that a little bit. His, his question is like, where's the breaking point of this is like too over conceptualized and difficult to get out, right? Is that what you mean? Okay. So this took me a long time. I was talking my way through it. But if I streamline this, we could probably make it in like four or to five steps with an assembly line. You would have your mise en place ready before your terrain would be dusted ahead of time. Uh, the great thing about the terrain is like throw it all in a thing. In a, in a hotel pan, sous vide it in the combi oven, take it out, cool it, cut it. It's like simple, if you will. It looks complicated. Then you would put the terrine. You probably want to do dots. I would probably put it one tight pipe puree right next to it, one green, one orange. And then you would have all your herbs laid out on a tray um, in piles, one coriander, one marigold, one XYZ, one. And then the next person would just go deep, 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 and deep, I th I think and Jason out the door, out the door. You could have three different assembly lines. You could do hundreds of these. I think Jason answered it as well with his stages to plating, knowing that, like, you know, depending on the event depends on, you know, like, your level of ambition, right? Correct. And also, um, the restaurant capacity dictates your menu. So yeah. if you know you're going to do 45 covers and you have a team of three chefs, also the chefs and the capacity of the restaurant dictates your menu. And also knowing what you want to do. There's some people that say, you know what, I want to find dining restaurant. I want this restaurant. But then, to be honest, it, it can't do numbers like that. You can't have 45 covers and want to turn over 200 covers a night. You need to know which, um, which genre you're going to sit in. But also, it doesn't mean that plating goes through the door. It means that you do it in stages. And also, too, a good chef will look at the caliber of the team he, he has. As there's something I always say, you have the team you deserve. So you mm. need to understand what your team is capable of and not um, I would say neglect them or leave them out at sea and then you're just stressed in the middle of service. So I think those are three points to look at. The restaurant capacity, your team, and also um, what do you want to achieve? Yeah, it's, it's the build. Um, and it's a week before you can start working on this dish, basically. So um, if you had to make this in one day, you're done. You're not going to make it in time, right? Maybe even if two days. Um, but if you are in the flow and you've thought about Basically, what I, this is kind of off subject, but I do a prep list that has color coded uh, red, yellow, and green. So the cooks have to do all the red items first, then the yellow items, and then the green items. Um, so that way, 
the, it's micromanaging without being on top of them. So they might not want to come in and they want to cut their chives at three o'clock and then start their, you know, braise at seven when, when service starts. They can't do that if they follow the directions. Um, so you can s keep that mindset, you know, a week ahead. Mm -hmm. That's great. One more question. One person. One question and we wrap. Uh, we have right over here. I think, I think that the use of the plants is really important and I, and I often question the, the, um, the plant's herbal action and I think like when you spoke of the scotch bonnet um, and you're speaking of like the different floral ingredients you use there, is, is that consideration ever part of your guys' concepts as chefs? Like uh, what the action of it as a, as a medicinal plant or its action in the, in the body, how it, how it how it counteracts with the meat, you know, as a digestive aid or a number of things. I mean, are those part of the intention or do you, like we talked a lot about shape and color today. Using herbs for functionality yeah, basically, com right? That Outside function. of flavor. Um, I personally don't, but actually I've had these conversations a lot in the last year or so and I, I potentially might be doing a project where that is absolutely coming into play into the concept itself. So I haven't put it into action. I've been doing some research, but I think it's a very now topic and it's something that people want to know that they're getting maybe a little bit more out of it, out of their food um, for a smarter, better reason. Uh, I think it, it's a very hot topic right now. Totally. And I would even challenge you to say that you're doing it unintentionally just through the way you perceive By using the quality ingredients like this? Right. Yes. I, without a doubt. Yeah. I think you are right when you say we're doing it unintentionally because to be honest, I never thought of it. I just like scotch bonnet. Totally. <laughs> it's totally. something that I grew up with. So to be honest, we grew up more um, in the Caribbean. We grew up eating a lot of ground provisions and stuff like that and using what we had. So to be honest, I, I think it's something that we did, I, I'm, I'm doing it unintentionally without yes. looking at the benefits and stuff. But when I look at benefits, I'm like, oh, wow, this is amazing. It does this, it does that. Even up to this morning, I was reading a study that says people that tend to endure heat or chili or, um, you know, of that variety. Spice. Yeah. Tend yes. to bear pain better. Yeah. I was like, what? Yeah. Oh, here you go. My <laughs> wife loves hot sauce. Yeah, here yeah. you go. You know, that's that is why sometimes I don't learn and I keep doing the same thing over and over and over because I like pain. Absolutely. But I work with no. youth and students and I tell my students when we do outdoor garden seminar to think of their inner garden, the inner garden inside of you. You know the ingredients that are in that garden. And yeah, like you said, your, your, your garden's full of chili. Correct. Right. And, to, and one thing I would like to tell everyone is no one needs to teach you how to cook. We just need to teach you how to look at food, how to see it how to approach it differently. No one has to teach you how to cook. Everyone knows how to cook. And I know some people say, not everyone knows how to cook, but everyone knows how to cook. It's if you want to cook. So for me, to be honest, we all have an upbringing, we all have a culture that we can relate to or that we fall, fall in love with. And I would say that is the, the, the precipice of it for you to start cooking. Just find something you enjoy to, to eat First, first thing first, find something you enjoy to eat, and it starts from there. Chef Rat, Chef Jason, yeah. thank you for watering our garden. Yeah. <laughs> enjoy the day. <laughs>